Number seven, Joe Lo. Born to a wealthy Malaysian family, in 1981, Joe Lo began making connections with powerful individuals from a very young age after being sent to the elite Harrow School in London to complete his pre-college education. The aspiring businessman then attended the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. While there, he garnered a reputation as an avid partier and was given the nickname the Asian Great Gatsby. It stemmed from his propensity to regularly spend thousands of dollars on elaborate social gatherings at some of the area's most fashionable venues. After graduating from Wharton, Lowe set out to use the connections he'd forged with influential business figures to make a name for himself in the investment world. He ultimately partnered with Malaysia's new prime minister, whose stepson he had befriended while attending the Harrow School. Lowe took control of 1MDB, a strategic development company owned by the Malaysian Ministry of Finance. The prestigious position gave him access to seemingly unlimited financial resources, and he soon resumed his habit of throwing lavish parties, which were bankrolled by 1MDB. Lowe became famous for his glamorous social functions, which were attended by celebrities such as Leonardo DiCaprio, Megan Fox, and Paris Hilton. It would later emerge that Lowe had actually paid many of the high-profile figures hundreds of thousands of dollars to make appearances at his parties. Federal investigators eventually delved into 1MDB's financial dealings, whereupon they discovered that the company had embezzled billions of dollars that were raised for fraudulent investment projects. As a result, Lowe faced money laundering charges in Malaysia and the United States. He subsequently became a fugitive from justice and as of the latest updates on the matter was believed to be residing somewhere in China. Number 6. Melissa Caddick On November the 12th of 2020, Australian financial advisor Melissa Caddick went missing after she'd become the focus of a Securities and Investments Commission investigation. The day prior to her disappearance, the 49-year-old's New South Wales residence had been stormed by federal agents following accusations that she'd stolen approximately $30 million from investors in her financial services business. Caddick's own friends and family members were also determined to have fallen prey to her cons. Subsequent reports detailed how in 2017, the woman had encouraged her mother and father to move. They reportedly gave their daughter $1 million to purchase a penthouse for them, but she instead used the money to buy an expensive diamond ring and help further fund her luxurious lifestyle. The Federal Court of Australia eventually discovered that Caddick's financial advisory practice served as an elaborate front for a Ponzi scheme. She'd actually used the proceeds from her fraudulent investments to buy multiple houses, high-end vehicles, and designer clothing. Following her disappearance, there was widespread speculation as to Caddick's possible whereabouts. Finally, in February of 2021, human remains that had been found off the coast of New South Wales were confirmed as Caddick's through DNA testing. A two-week inquest into the specific circumstances of Caddick's sudden disappearance and presumed death was scheduled to take place in September of 2022. Number 5. Mark Acklam in 2012, Englishwoman Carolyn Woods, aged 61, believed she was in a committed relationship with a man she knew as Mark Conway. He claimed to be a wealthy Swiss banker and MI6 agent. He reportedly promised to marry her in spite of the fact that he was still living with his wife and two children in southwest England. 45-year-old Conway convinced Woods to lend him roughly $1.1 million which resulted in the woman draining all of her pension and life savings. Her prospective paramour subsequently fled the country, leaving Woods in total financial ruin. It later emerged that Conway was actually a prolific con artist named Mark Acklam, who'd previously been imprisoned in Spain on three separate occasions for fraud-related offenses. Acklam used the money he'd swindled from Woods to fund renovation projects at his various properties, purchase a portion rent out a Georgian manor in Somerset. The National Crime Agency placed him on their list of 10 most wanted fugitives and a European arrest warrant was issued for him in 2016. The following year, Acklam was tracked down by the authorities in Geneva, Switzerland, where he was believed to have been residing with his family. He was ultimately arrested at his luxury apartment in Zurich before being extradited back to the UK where he faced fraud charges. In August of 2019, Acklam was sentenced to five years and eight months in prison following a trial at Bristol Crown Court. Number 4. Kylie White A mutual friend introduced New Jersey couple Linda and Steve Evans to a woman who claimed to be suffering from 
terminal brain cancer in early June of 2018. Kylie White also reportedly told the Evanses that due to a traumatic family history, she'd been left homeless. As a gesture of compassion, the couple allowed 26-year-old White to stay with them at their Egg Harbor Township residence for over a month. During that time, the Evanses took care of the young woman, provided her with a bed of her own and regular meals. It was later described to investigators how White would groan in pain on a nightly basis, and Linda Evans often massaged her legs to help relieve some of the discomfort brought on by her purported illness. The couple's relatives, however, grew increasingly suspicious of White. They reportedly told them about a woman from Pennsylvania who'd faked a terminal illness and took advantage of a family who'd agreed to let her spend her final days with them. Local police subsequently launched an investigation into White's background, whereupon it was determined that she was, in fact, the fraudster from Pennsylvania and had been victimizing the Evans with a similar scheme. To uphold her deception, White had falsified medical records and notes from her doctors, which she showed to the couple as proof of her looming death. The young woman would leave her newfound home almost every day, supposedly to visit a hospital in Philadelphia. However, it emerged that she'd actually been spending her time babysitting and working at a local restaurant. Linda and Steve had reportedly spent nearly $1,000 on White during her extended stay, and she was consequently charged with theft by deception and harassment. Number 3. Davion Sandifer In 2021, Houston police identified an individual believed to be the mastermind behind a series of scams that had victimized local residents. On July the 20th, Davion Sandifer was arrested and charged with five fraud-related counts. Court documents detailed how the 21-year-old had uploaded a fake job posting on LinkedIn for a director of security position at the Genesis Charitable Foundation. An unsuspecting man ended up applying for the job, but as it turned out, the foundation was actually Sandifer's illegitimate charity, which he regularly used to collect donations under false pretenses. Believing himself to have landed a real job, the victim provided sensitive personal information to Sandifer. The con artist then used the information to apply for a loan, lease an apartment, and open multiple bank accounts. In a separate case from earlier in the year, Sandifer had allegedly hacked into a woman's social media accounts to ask her friends for money. He was also accused of creating online dating profiles with her name and photograph. Upon his arrest, it emerged that Sandifer had also been convicted in another fraud case while he was a student at Briarcliff University in Iowa. The young man was released on bond in September of 2021, but within a week, he'd already swindled two more victims out of $80,000 in order to bail his lover out of jail. As of the latest updates on the case, Sandifer was still wanted by the authorities. Number 2. Anthony Gignac in 2017, a man who presented himself as Prince Khalid bin Al Saud of the Saudi royal family began negotiating with real estate developers about a potential $400 million investment in an upscale Miami Beach hotel. Khalid, who reportedly referred to himself as Prince and Sultan, led a lavish lifestyle that convinced his prospective business partners that his supposed royal status was legitimate. He wore expensive jewelry, owned multiple luxury vehicles, and resided in a penthouse apartment on Miami's affluent Fisher Island. One of Khalid's partners, a wealthy real estate mogul named Jeffrey Soffer, began to grow suspicious of the self-proclaimed prince. Khalid's hubris consisted of Soffer witnessing him eat bacon and other pork products, which is in clear violation of fundamental Muslim doctrine. This struck Sofa as more than a little odd, given that Khalid had claimed to be a royal from the country where Islam originated. The real estate developer subsequently hired a private investigator to look into Khalid's past, which then led to an official probe into the purported prince's activities. It ultimately emerged that Khalid had fabricated his royal identity and that he was actually Anthony Gignac, a Colombian-born scam artist. In total, Gignac had reportedly swindled his investors out of $8 million, which he used to fund his indulgent lifestyle. The fraudster had previously been arrested 11 other times for similar prince-related schemes. Gignac pleaded guilty to fraud charges and, in June of 2019, was sentenced to more than 18 years in prison. Number 1. Glenn Rycroft in the mid-2000s, Gareth MacDonald, a married father of three from Prestatyn, North Wales, became romantically involved with a former British Airways steward named Glenn Rycroft. 30-year-old MacDonald's wife eventually found out about his affair, but 
the couple continued to live together for the sake of their children. As was detailed in later reports, Rycroft, age 33, would regularly treat his lover to expensive gifts and make grand romantic gestures over the course of their relationship. However, in 2007, McDonald noticed that Rycroft had largely stopped paying for things when they went out on dates. Then McDonald's own credit card started getting declined and he began to grow suspicious that Rycroft might be somehow involved. Upon digging into the particularities of his partner's background, McDonald uncovered that Rycroft had previously been found guilty of swindling more than $250,000 in a fraudulent investment scheme. While on the verge of learning more about Rycroft's past misdeeds, McDonald was found dead in a Travelodge hotel room in September of 2007. Investigators ultimately determined that the man had been beaten to death with a fire extinguisher by Rycroft himself, who'd sought to keep the unsavory details of his past a secret. In 2009, the con man turned killer was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Number seven, Lawrence Eisenberg. In March of 2018, the authorities recovered the body of Larry Eisenberg from Lake Coeur d'Alene in Idaho. About a month prior, the 68-year-old was reported to have fallen from a boat as he tried to fix its motor and drowned. At the time, he was on a fishing trip with his wife, Lorsine, also known as Lori, who called in the purported accident. A series of revelations followed that ultimately pointed to the woman who was also in her 60s as her husband's killer just days before the body was discovered. It emerged that she'd embezzled over $570,000 from the non-profit organization where she worked. Larry's autopsy then revealed diphenhydramine toxicity as the cause of death, and it was suspected that he'd been poisoned with a lethal dose of Benadryl. A known subject of contention between the couple had always been Laurie's tendency of giving too much money to her six daughters from previous relationships. Nevertheless, there were handwritten changes to Larry's will, which had modified it to leave 80% of his estate to Laurie's daughters and only 20% to his own children. In 2019, Laurie was sentenced to five years in prison after pleading guilty to multiple counts of wire fraud while still under investigation for killing her husband. In February of the following year, she was charged with murder. After the evidence solidified her ruthless scam, Laurie had killed Larry so that he wouldn't find out about the embezzlement and then divorce her, which could have seen her left with nothing from their joint estate worth over one and a half million dollars. She pleaded guilty to second degree murder under an Alford plea, meaning she maintained her innocence but recognized she'd be found guilty if the case went to trial and was sentenced to life in prison. In court, Laurie admitted to lacing a drink with Benadryl, allegedly intending to take her own life, but that Larry had drunk it while she was sleeping on the boat. A judge would, however, tell her that the statement didn't stand up to the evidence. Number six, O'Neill McGean and Brian Betts. Two men who'd at one point been in a romantic relationship were lured through dating scams and suffered eerily similar fates, roughly six years apart. O'Neill McGean and Brian Betts had met in the 1990s and were together for over a decade before splitting up with the former moving to Mexico and the latter residing in Maryland. In 2010, Betts, a middle school principal, talked to a man later identified as 19-year-old Alante Saunders through a phone chat line. They'd agreed to meet at Betts' home and he left the door to his residence unlocked. Saunders and two teenage accomplices then burst in and robbed the 42-year-old before fatally shooting him. The attackers were subsequently arrested on murder and robbery charges, with Saunders sentenced to 40 years in prison. McGean, who described Betts as the love of his life, vowed to be more cautious with dating in the wake of his demise. His weariness unfortunately waned in the years that followed. In October of 2016, he met a man through a dating app and agreed to meet in a hotel in Mazatlan, the Mexican town where he was living. McGean then disappeared along with $16,000 from his bank accounts. Jorge Guillen Gonzalez, the man's former lover and business partner with whom he'd opened a cafe, started receiving messages from kidnappers demanding $26,000. The message exchange, initiated from McGean's phone, continued for a few days but then abruptly stopped. McGean's body was then discovered in a yard buried under freshly poured concrete. At the hotel where he'd been lured, the attackers beat him so severely that they'd punctured both his lungs, killing him. His body was then wrapped in a hotel curtain, stuffed in a bag, and transported across town to be buried. Gonzalez, 
who was rumored to have been fired from the cafe by McGean and banned from his home, was suspected to have orchestrated the plot. He maintained his innocence but was arrested along with three other men. Number 5. Sarah Daisley In early October of 2021, disgraced former St. George bank worker Sarah Daisley was arrested in her native Australia once more in a massive fraud case. Daisley had been investigated for months leading up to her initial arrest in December of the previous year at a Sydney CBD venue. Footage, which made headlines across the country, showed her being taken in the back of a police van while wearing a skin-tight grey jumpsuit. The case against Daisley revealed her as the alleged mastermind behind a fraud operation from which she'd ultimately incur roughly 127 charges. She also reportedly had ties to the criminal underworld through her drug dealer husband, David Suka, who'd been convicted to over 20 years in prison in Western Australia. He was only 23 when he was arrested in 2004, after arriving at the port of Albany with an estimated 220 pounds of cocaine on a South American cargo ship. Since 2016, Daisley had stolen the identities of multiple people from driver's licenses and used her position at the bank to create fake accounts, through which she moved hundreds of thousands of dollars. She reportedly siphoned $350,000 from an elderly individual, basically stealing all of their life savings. In October of 2021, Daisley was again taken into custody, along with three other suspects, after the police had seized $400,000 cash, documents, and electronic items. Three weeks before her arrest, the 30-year-old had given birth to twins, cared for in her absence by Suka, who'd been paroled. In late October, the mother of four posted the 1.8 million bail and stated an intention of combating the charges against her, with a trial date potentially as far away as late 2023. The plethora of charges on which she stands accused includes 72 counts of possession of false documents to obtain financial advantage and 26 counts of possessing information to commit an indictable offense, among many others. Even if Daisley is convicted on half of the counts, it would still likely result in a custodial sentence. Number 4. Oro Jesse Amoka In the late 2000s, an Australian woman began an online relationship with a 28-year-old Nigerian man named Oro Jesse Amoka. In 2010, the pair met in Johannesburg and spent some time together without incident. Jet Jacobs, then in her mid-60s, vowed to return to South Africa and be with her lover again. Throughout their four-year-long relationship, which mainly unfolded over the internet, Jacobs had sent Amoka over $90,000. Family members warned the woman that she was being scammed and cautioned her against a second trip to Johannesburg that she'd been planning. Jacobs unfortunately couldn't be dissuaded. On February the 9th of 2013, two days after she'd met up with Amoka, the 67-year-old's lifeless body was found at her rented villa in Johannesburg. Jacobs's money, credit cards, jewelry, and laptop were missing, along with other personal items. Amoka, who in the meantime had returned to Nigeria, was arrested and charged with fraud. The University of Ibadan undergraduate was discovered to have had 32 fake online identities. While it was always suspected that Amoka had had a hand in Jacobs's death, he was never charged with murder due to the authorities' inability to prove it. Number 3. Shaniqua Jordan Shaniqua Jordan, the fashion blogger from Brooklyn, was arrested and extradited from New York on multiple charges stemming from scams involving identity theft. In March of 2017, a Stanford woman reported that several purchases had been made from her card without her permission and that accounts had been opened in her name without her knowledge. The fraudster had attempted purchases amounting to $54,000 which included two high-end Rolex watches, but only 3,300 went through, mainly on a luxury shoulder bag from Yves Saint Laurent. It was delivered at the victim's home address, but because 30-year-old Jordan had also registered a UPS account in her name, she was able to intercept the package. As financial crimes officers looked into the case and closed in on the blogger as a suspect, they learned that she'd already been arrested for pulling another identity theft scam on a woman from Falls Township, Pennsylvania. Jordan had ordered an $18,000 Rolex from a California-based company who'd noticed some irregularities with the purchase and contacted local police. The authorities convinced them to send an empty box to the FedEx facility where delivery had been requested, 
Jordan was arrested at the facility when she showed up with a fraudulent driver's license in the victim's name. Number 2. A Ling Lu and Ji Hun Li Two California women were arrested on September the 19th of 2019 after running a scam that saw them earn close to $1 million in merchandise. A Ling Lu and Ji Hun Li, both aged 25, were apprehended at an apartment complex in Los Angeles on suspicions of theft by false pretenses and conspiracy. The investigation had been initiated following the events of September the 4th, when a man received a cold call from someone claiming to be an employee of the Internal Revenue Service. They said that the man would be arrested if he didn't pay them with $2,200 worth of Target gift cards. In such cases, scammers would typically have their marks read off the card's serial number. The victim obliged but then contacted the authorities. They worked together with Target Loss Prevention and looked over surveillance footage from multiple locations to see who would redeem the cards, ultimately identifying Lou and Lee as suspects. After the women were arrested, search warrants were executed at two locations linked to them, with officers finding hundreds of thousands of dollars in electronics and other items that the scammers had purchased with the gift cards. Number 1. Rachel Elwell in 2021, a woman from Brown Hills, England, gave a fraudster over $150,000, convinced that she was securing his release from Eastern European loan sharks. 50-year-old Rachel Elwell had met a man she described as attractive and intelligent through Facebook's dating app in early 2021, and they struck up an instant connection. The man claimed that he lived in nearby Coventry, and the pair agreed to meet in person once lockdown restrictions were lifted. However, the scammer then claimed he had to leave for Ukraine on an engineering contract. He later convinced Elwell that he was being forcibly held in a basement by criminals and made her believe that she was the only one who could save him. It was an elaborate scam involving multiple people seemingly confirming the man's identity. Elwell sent him about $10,000 from her own savings and then took out three massive loans. It appeared as if the matter had been resolved and Elwell expected him to arrive at Heathrow Airport. After she'd waited for over four hours, she was approached by Border Force officials who told her she'd likely been scammed. Elwell then traveled to the Coventry address her prospective lover had given her and found that no one by that name lived there. She'd subsequently hoped that her banks would reimburse the money she'd taken out. Under a code of conduct that protected victims of fraud, the woman was further heartbroken as the banks concluded she wasn't eligible for a refund. Number 8. Sherry Papini California woman Sherry Papini disappeared in the afternoon of November the 2nd of 2016 after going for a run through the rural neighborhood surrounding her Reading residence. Papini's husband tracked her cell phone to a location less than a mile from their home at the intersection of Old Oregon Trail and Sunrise Drive, but the mother of two herself was nowhere to be found. The 34-year-old's family then began to fear that she'd been kidnapped and a massive search operation was set into motion. Rescue crews used scent dogs and helicopters to comb the area, but for the first few weeks, the search failed to yield any results. Eventually, on Thanksgiving Day, Papini was found bound with restraints on the side of the road near the city of Woodland. She had reportedly suffered a number of injuries, including a broken nose and a mark on her shoulder that appeared to have been inflicted with a branding iron. In subsequent interviews with investigators, Papini claimed to have been abducted by a pair of Spanish-speaking women on the day she'd gone missing. Her captors had allegedly kept her chained in a closet and would periodically beat her at gunpoint and brand her with the red-hot tool. Papini was able to provide the FBI with detailed physical descriptions of the two supposed assailants, which sketch artists used to create composite images that were then released to the public. In March of 2022, however, disturbing details came to light regarding the true nature of Papini's abduction. According to a Department of Justice press release, the woman had fabricated the story of her disappearance and had actually been voluntarily staying with her ex-boyfriend in Costa Mesa, as her family was desperately searching for her. Papini also reportedly went so far as to harm herself in order to support the false statements she subsequently gave to the authorities. When federal agents confronted her with evidence of her deception, Papini refused to recant her previous testimony and even provided more false details about her purported abductors. She was consequently arrested and charged with making false statements to a federal law enforcement officer and engaging in mail fraud. Number 7. Natalie Schlett and Micah Reisner Shortly after 9pm on March the 9th, 
of 2017, police officers in Sandusky, Ohio, rushed to a home in the 600 block of Meigs Street in response to reports that a homicide had occurred on the premises. Upon their arrival, however, the officers found that the homeowners, identified as Natalie Schlett and Micah Reisner, had staged the former's gruesome murder. The alarm was raised after they'd sent a picture of her supposedly lifeless body to their family. Reisner later detailed how he'd wiped ketchup all over the bathroom after Schlett assumed a pose in the tub that made it appear as if she was dead. After they'd shared a picture of the grisly scene with Reisner's sister via Facebook Messenger, several concerned friends who were unaware that it was actually a hoax contacted the police. It subsequently emerged that the couple had come up with the stunt as an attempt to get Reisner's sister to come to their house with the intention of confronting her for allegedly stealing money from them. The prank ultimately had unintended consequences for the engaged couple as they were charged with inducing panic in the incident's aftermath. Number 6. Clovino da Silva On August 3rd of 2019, at the end of the regularly scheduled visited hours, guards at the Banju jail complexes in Brazil spotted a suspicious individual attempting to leave through the front doors. Rio de Janeiro's deputy head of prison operations later detailed how one of the detention officers on duty quickly realized that a woman who was walking out of the facility was actually an inmate in disguise. The prisoner was restrained and taken back inside, at which point he was identified as Clovino da Silva, a drug dealer from the city of Angra dos Reis, who was serving a 73-year prison sentence. In a video released by prison authorities, the silver was shown removing the various components of his disguise, which included a plastic mask, a wig, glasses, and women's clothes. Investigators reportedly believed that the constituting elements of the elaborate facade had been smuggled into the jail by a pregnant woman who hadn't undergone the same rigorous searches as other visitors. It's a relatively widespread aspect that, in many prison systems, has led to pregnant women being used to transport contraband. It later emerged that De Silva's plan had been to leave his 19-year-old daughter inside the prison in his stead. She and seven others were reportedly arrested in connection to the ruse, while De Silva himself was transferred to another jail unit and held in solitary confinement as punishment. A few days later, it was reported that De Silva had been found dead in his jail cell from an apparent hanging. Number 5. Samantha Ely Texas woman Samantha Ely approached a group of teenagers as they were playing on the swings at a Fort Worth park on October the 23rd of 2019. Ely shouted at them to leave immediately and the ensuing confrontation was recorded by an individual at the scene and went viral on social media in the aftermath. As was shown in the video, Ely marched up to the teens and loudly declared that they were too old to be on the playground equipment. The 38-year-old then tried to push one of the teenagers off the swing and unloaded an expletive-laden rant in which she identified herself as a police officer and threatened to arrest them. In a second video captured later that same day, Ely was shown harassing parents in a different section of the park. She appeared to push her way through a group of adults in order for her own child to use the equipment. The woman told the other parents that their children were too old to be in the play area, something that she claimed to know for a fact because she owned the park. While Ely maintained that children over the age of six were prohibited from using the park's rides and equipment, another parent pointed out that a nearby sign indicated the playground was meant for those aged 5 to 12. The Fort Worth Police Department later released a statement in which they clarified that Ely wasn't, in fact, a police officer and the woman was consequently charged with one count of impersonating a public servant. Number 4. Audrey Franceschini On the morning of May the 10th of 2021, several students at the American Senior High School in Hialeah, Florida, were approached by an individual who was roaming the halls and distributing pamphlets that promoted her Instagram page. She was wearing a backpack and carrying a skateboard in an attempt to portray herself as a student. But it would later emerge that the person passing out flyers was actually 28-year-old Audrey Franceschini. A security guard approached a woman at one point and asked what she was doing, to which Franceschini reportedly replied that she was looking for the registration office. She then wandered off and continued giving students her personalized literature as they entered their classrooms. Police later detailed how she was once again questioned by security but simply walked away and ultimately left the grounds a short time later. After a few hours, Franceschini was arrested by local police and charged with felony trespassing, misdemeanor interfering with a school, and 
resisting arrest without violence. Subsequent reports indicated that Franceschini had previously worked as a law enforcement officer in Georgia. She had been fired in 2017 after allegedly hacking into a colleague's social media account and posting an explicit photograph of them online. Number 3. Christopher Tomberlin In 2015, authorities in Bibb County, Georgia issued an arrest warrant for local man Christopher Tomberlin, who was accused of biting his girlfriend and throwing a hatchet at her during a domestic dispute at their Mason residence. He was taken into custody on charges of aggravated assault, battery and making threats. Reports later surfaced that following his release from jail on bond, Tomberlin had passed away due to an undetermined cause and there was even a Facebook post announcing his death. A few years later in May of 2021, the Oklahoma City Police Department received an anonymous tip that Tomberlin was still alive and living in the Oklahoma City metro area under an alias. On May the 27th, the man was located and arrested by a joint task force composed of US Marshals and local police officers. Investigators concluded that Tomberlin had faked his own death before fleeing nearly a thousand miles from Mason to Oklahoma City. He'd successfully remained undetected for roughly six years, using several different fake identities to avoid raising suspicion. It was reported that Tomberlin was working from home as a freelance tattoo artist at the time of his capture. Number 2. Paul Anthony Menchaca On September the 6th of 2018, Paul Anthony Menchaca was taken into police custody at his parents' house in Gilbert, Arizona. Leading up to his arrest, investigators had spoken with three women who'd all testified that Menchaca had lied to them about his medical condition to solicit their caretaking services. The 31-year-old man reportedly used online service providers such as CareLinks and Care.com to find workers willing to serve as his caregivers. Police reported that Menchaca would pose as his mother, Amy, and claimed that he had Down syndrome and therefore needed workers to bathe him and change his diapers. One of the victims of his exploitative scheme claimed to have assisted Menchaca with up to 30 diaper changes and baths during her time as his caretaker. To make his deception as believable as possible, Menchaca also allegedly took on a childlike demeanor and threw temper tantrums on several occasions. One of the victims eventually grew suspicious that Menchaca's condition was actually a fabrication and she followed him to his parents' house, where he was dropped off by another caretaker. She confronted the man's parents, who confirmed that Menchaca didn't have Down syndrome and wasn't required to wear diapers or be assisted in the manner in which he'd been. The man was ultimately criminally charged in connection to his predatory ruse. Menchaca formerly served as a crossing guard for the Chandler Unified School District, although it was reported that he'd resigned from the position in the wake of his arrest. Number 1. Josh Paler Lin and Leah Say In April of 2021, a pair of social media influencers staged a prank video in which one of them attempted to gain entry into an Indonesian supermarket by painting a blue surgical mask on her face instead of actually wearing one. US-based YouTuber Josh Paler Lin and Russian Instagram influencer Leah Se devised the stunt after they were turned away from the store for failing to comply with the COVID-19 mask mandate set in place in the country's Bali province. In an attempt to trick the supermarket security personnel, they applied blue makeup to Say's face to make it appear as if she was wearing a face covering. The ploy initially worked and the tourists filmed themselves walking around the store, noting in the footage that very few people seemed to notice Say's fake mask. The stunt quickly went viral after Lin and Say posted the recording online and it was eventually brought to the attention of Indonesian immigration officials. The two influencers were then taken into custody for breaching Bali's pandemic regulations and they were detained in an immigration center pending their deportation from the country. Under normal circumstances, first-time violators of Bali's COVID-19 rules would have only been fined roughly $70. However, local authorities sought to have the pair of foreigners removed from the island immediately given the overtly deliberate nature of their infraction. Number 8. Katrina Phelan On December the 1st of 2021, a teacher at Abraham Lincoln High School in Iowa was taken into police custody on suspicion of making violent threats. 37-year-old Katrina Phelan was suspected to have written a series of anonymous notes in which she'd made reference to an imminent act of gun violence on school property. Each of the handwritten papers had either been found by the teacher herself 
or inside of her classroom at the high school. When local police were made aware of the situation, they issued an arrest warrant, prompting Phelan's subsequent surrender. Upon interviewing the teacher, investigators determined that her threats of mass violence weren't legitimate and that she'd written the fake notes to incite panic among school officials. In at least one of the letters, Phelan pretended to be a student and claimed an intention of violently lashing out after being relentlessly bullied. The teacher's arrest came only one day after the Oxford High School shooting in Michigan. She ultimately confessed to forging the threatening notes as a way of expressing her concern that such an attack might unfold in her own classroom. In the wake of the incident, Phelan was terminated from her position at the high school and detained at the Potawatomi County Jail while awaiting her case's legal proceedings. Number 7. Kane Mitchell For a period of roughly eight months in 2019, Kane Mitchell lived with his girlfriend, Lucy Smith, and her son, Teddy, in the English town of St. Neots. At about 3 p.m. on November the 1st, emergency services were called to their residence. After Teddy had gone into cardiac arrest and become unresponsive, he was taken to a local hospital and kept on life support for 10 days. Teddy was found to have sustained several critical injuries to which he succumbed on November the 11th. As Cambridgeshire investigators would eventually learn, the victim's health problems had been caused by Mitchell himself. Weeks prior to Teddy's hospitalization, the couple's neighbors had alerted local authorities expressing concerns on how he was being treated, particularly by Mitchell. Even though the latter had been directly responsible for Teddy's injuries, he was captured on video pretending to be a caring father at the hospital, crying over the victim while saying, come on baby, daddy is here. Shortly after his questionable display of emotion, Mitchell was arrested. Following a four-week trial at the Royal Court of Cambridge, he was convicted of murder and jailed for a minimum of 18 years. Number 6. Solomon Shlomo Azari A man was accused of racking up a $42,000 tab at a Florida hotel over the course of two months in the summer of 2019 by falsely claiming to be a relative of Canadian tennis player Eugenie Bouchard. According to subsequent reports, Solomon Shlomo Azari pretended to be her brother Will at the One Hotel South Beach in Miami, where the Bouchard family reportedly resided. Azari proceeded to charge a series of exorbitant expenses to the player's running tab, eating at the hotel's Habitat restaurant and drinking at its rooftop bar using her account. The hotel ultimately caught on to Azari's deception and launched an official investigation into the matter after a member of Bouchard's team disputed a $29,000 bill on July the 30th of 2019. When investigators showed Bouchard a photograph of Azari, she revealed that she'd never met him and hadn't authorized any of the charges he'd made to the account. He was taken into the custody of Miami police and charged with scheme to defraud, identity fraud, and grand theft. Number 5. Casey Smitherman On January the 9th of 2019, Casey Smitherman, the superintendent of Indiana's Elwood Community Schools, used her own insurance to pay for a 15-year-old student's medical treatment. Court records indicated that the student hadn't shown up to school on the day in question because he was suffering from a sore throat. In the past, Smitherman had reportedly bought the teen clothes and even helped him clean his house. She'd chosen not to contact the Department of Child Services about his situation, however, because she feared he would subsequently be placed in foster care. When the student failed to arrive at school, Smitherman went to his house to pick him up and take him to a local clinic, where she pretended that he was her son so that she could use her insurance to pay for the visit. She later took the student to a CVS in order to fill a prescription for amoxicillin, which Smitherman also completed with the name of her actual son. The teenager reportedly tore the label off the bottle of medication because he knew it was wrong for him to possess a prescription under someone else's name. The following week, the police were tipped off about what Smitherman had done for the student, and she was consequently arrested on charges of official misconduct, insurance fraud, insurance application fraud, and identity deception. In the wake of the incident, Smitherman's teaching license was suspended for 90 days, and she was forced to resign from her position as the school district superintendent. Number 4. Rutledge Dees in November of 2019, Louisiana man Rutledge Dees was arrested at his New Orleans residence on suspicion of pretending to be a mentally impaired teenager so that female caretakers would look after him. Dees reportedly created a profile on the online app Urban Sitter, which he used to hire a college-aged woman to take care of his fake 18-year-old brother Corey. When the help worker arrived at his home, 29-year-old Dees allegedly posed as Corey and pretended to be disabled. 
Diaz's fraudulent behavior continued for about a year, during which his hired caregiver would regularly change his soiled diapers and treat him like an infant. The 20-year-old victim eventually grew suspicious of the situation. After examining Deez's profile on a payment service app, she realized that Deez, the individual who'd been paying for her services, was actually the person she knew as Corey, at which point she contacted the authorities. Deez was taken into custody on several charges, one of which was possession of a Schedule II controlled dangerous substance, as the police had found crystal methamphetamine inside his home. In December of 2020, Dees pleaded guilty to his charges and was consequently sentenced to five years of probation and 400 hours of community service. Number three, Trent Freeman. In the fall of 2021, a deputy of the Gilchrist County Sheriff's Office in Florida was arrested for stealing $3,700 in paid sick time by pretending to be hospitalized with COVID-19. As revealed by subsequent reports, 38-year-old Trent Freeman had forged multiple doctor's signatures over the course of about two months. She'd done so to maintain the deception that she'd contracted a critical case of the virus and therefore couldn't be present at work. Although her falsified medical documents indicated that she was comatose in the hospital, Freeman had actually begun working full-time in the private sector, while also recouping sick time payments from her law enforcement employers. Her fraud was first detected on October the 5th of 2021, when the Sheriff's Office opened an investigation into the legitimacy of her medical filings. Shortly thereafter, she was fired from her position and taken into the custody of her former colleagues on forgery and fraud charges. Number 2. Donald Klein Former fertility specialist and gynecologist Donald Klein fathered dozens of his patients' children without their consent throughout the 1970s and 80s. Indiana resident Jacoba Ballard, aged 33, joined an online forum for adoptees and donor-conceived children in 2014. While trying to find out whether she had any half-siblings, she quickly connected with three other individuals whose mothers had been treated by Klein prior to their pregnancies. Upon taking genetic ancestry tests, Ballard and the others learned that they were indeed half-siblings. The discovery was followed by the revelation that they also shared four additional half-siblings with the same biological father. Ballard subsequently cross-matched her DNA with public databases and during the course of her research continually came across the surname Klein among her distant relatives. It was then that she began to suspect that the fertility specialist had used his own reproductive fluid in his past patients' attempts to artificially get pregnant. Ballard and her half-siblings confronted Klein about their suspicions during a reunion organized by the doctor's son. Klein allegedly confessed to carrying out the elaborate deception, which ultimately resulted in his DNA being used to conceive more than 50 children across the state of Indiana. In addition to having his medical license revoked, the retired doctor also faced two felony counts of obstruction of justice, as well as a fine of $500. Klein's widespread fertility fraud became the basis of a Netflix documentary titled Our Father, which premiered on the streaming platform in May of 2022. Number 1. Timothy Gatchell Flagler College student Amy Blunt and a group of her friends went to St. George's Tavern in St. Augustine, Florida on a night in November of 1990. At about 2 a.m., Blunt went for a walk out to the coastline with a young man named Sean Nolan. They reportedly got into a fight at some point and then decided to return to their respective homes separately. The following morning, Blunt's roommate discovered that she hadn't come back to their apartment and she was subsequently reported missing to the police. Investigators' initial efforts to locate Blunt proved fruitless and after about 10 days, they offered a $10,000 reward for any information about her disappearance. This led to an influx of tips including one from a local man named Timothy Gatchell, who told detectives that he'd seen Blount in the downtown area on the night she'd gone missing. Gatchell claimed to have witnessed the young woman get into an older model car and drive away with at least two people. A few weeks later, a dog walker came upon human remains buried under a pile of logs and rocks in a deserted area on the outskirts of St. Augustine. An autopsy subsequently confirmed that the body was indeed that of Blount, who'd been beaten before being stabbed a total of five times. Investigators then learned that one of their previous witnesses, Gatchell, was a tenant in a mobile home on the plot of land where Blount's body had been found. When questioned further by the police, Gatchell eventually confessed to giving her a ride home on the night. They reportedly gotten into an argument which culminated with the man taking out a knife and fatally stabbing Blount. In the wake of the murder, Gatchell had pretended to be a witness, giving the police a false testimony in an attempt to deviate them from identifying him as a suspect. 
He was ultimately convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Number 7. Tiffany Henderson In December of 2019, aspiring Houston rapper Tavoris Henderson, aged 21, was arrested and charged with capital murder in the death of Nassau Bay Police Sergeant Kayla Sullivan. The 43-year-old officer was assisting in a traffic stop after Henderson's Jeep had been pulled over for speeding through an apartment complex. Sullivan initiated the arrest when it emerged that the man had an outstanding warrant for domestic violence. As he was being handcuffed, Henderson managed to break free from the arresting officers and got back behind the wheel of his Jeep. The man would later admit to the police that he knew Sullivan was still partially inside the vehicle when he started to drive off. The sergeant was dragged beneath the Jeep, then ran over and killed. Henderson, who performed under the rap name Killer Dre, went on the run, sparking a manhunt during the course of which the murder vehicle was found abandoned. The police, assisted by a SWAT team, questioned his mother, Tiffany, who initially claimed that she didn't even know him before eventually feigning ignorance regarding his whereabouts. However, it would later emerge that Henderson had called Tiffany shortly after running the policewoman over. She and her boyfriend then helped him hide. About half an hour before she'd lied to the officers, surveillance cameras showed Tiffany picking her son up and dropping him off at a hotel. A tip to Crime Stoppers of Houston subsequently led to his arrest and, in a presumed symbolic gesture, officers reportedly used Sullivan's handcuffs to restrain him. He was charged with murder while Tiffany, who maintained that her son was innocent, was charged with hindering apprehension alongside her boyfriend. Number 6. Khadija Senna On August the 13th of 2017, Khadija Senna contacted the police in El Paso, Texas, claiming that her 2013 Dodge Dart had been stolen. 21-year-old Senna filed the report at 7.35, alleging that the theft had occurred in the 200 block of Cincinnati Avenue in West El Paso. However, investigators later found that she'd called the police for assistance roughly five hours earlier on the same day while she was in a construction area on a freeway. They found the Dodge in a dirt pile in the 700 block of Executive Center and determined that it had been involved in a crash. Senna had presumably hoped her initial call would be disregarded if she reported the vehicle stolen, which the police concluded it never had been. The woman was arrested and booked into El Paso County Jail on a $4,000 bond after being charged with filing a false report to a peace officer and perjury. Number 5. John and Jonatina Barksdale In March of 2022, two siblings were charged in Manhattan Federal Court over a multi-million dollar cryptocurrency scam. The Securities and Exchange Commission separately charged John and Jonatina, Tina Barksdale, both in their 40s with conducting fraudulent unregistered offerings of Ormia's coin. Both were US citizens, although at the time of the investigation, John was living in Thailand and his sister in Hong Kong. The SEC found that the siblings had lied about the value and profitability of Ormia's coin, including that the coin was backed by a massive mining operation, generating more than $5 million of monthly revenue. They'd advertised their fraudulent operation through social media and in-person roadshows, but also a giant Times Square video display, proclaiming that the backbone of the coin was a $250 million mining farm. Between January of 2017 and October of 2021, the Barksdales had made over $124 million by lying to at least 20,000 investors from all over the world through their multi-level marketing company, Ormia's Global SA. They'd used their illicit gains on travel, real estate, and other personal expenses. The SEC concluded that the siblings had acted as modern-day snake oil salesmen, and prosecutors alleged they'd abandoned their mining operations in 2019. To promote their fraudulent activity, they'd used a photo of a mining facility in Montana that was operated by a third party. They'd also arranged for their website to display the Bitcoin wallet of an unknown individual as the Ormia's reserve vault, boasting $190 million in assets as of November 2021. In reality, Ormia's wallets were worth less than half a million dollars. According to the Justice Department, John faced spending 64 years, essentially the rest of his life, in prison, if convicted on all the charges levied against him, which included securities fraud, wire fraud, and conspiracy. No attorneys for the Barksdales had been identified 
as of the latest updates on the matter. Number 4. Morgan Quinn Model Morgan Quinn, who'd appeared on the first season of reality TV show Project Runway, filed a report with the New York Police Department on August the 7th of 2013. Designers on the show had dubbed Quinn Morganza, as her antics, which included being late, damaging outfits and frequent emotional outbursts, would constantly disrupt the competition. In her report, 30-year-old Quinn told the police that she'd been pushed inside a Murray Hill building and held at knife point by a tall homeless man. The suspect then reportedly threw her down the stairs and made off with her Chanel purse and a cocktail ring that was inside it, which Quinn claimed was worth over $2,000. The police did discover her empty purse about a week later, but after reviewing all the footage from surveillance cameras in the area, found no evidence of the mugging and charged Quinn with filing a false report on August the 23rd. The model battled the charge in court and at one point during her ensuing appearances, jokingly claimed, I'll join the NYPD once this gets dismissed. Prosecutors eventually determined that the mugging had occurred, but not in the manner in which she reported it to the police. The crux of the matter remained that Quinn had greatly exaggerated the value of the stolen property. She was offered an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal in October of 2014, which she accepted. The model had to complete one day of community service and keep herself out of legal trouble for six months for the charges to be dropped. In an ironic twist, Quinn herself would be charged with petit larceny and possession of stolen property in the fifth degree in November of 2015, after being accused of stealing makeup and sunglasses from a friend's handbag and then lying about it. Number 3. Evgeny Markov Following her divorce, Russian snowboarder and skier Irina Kozlova had begun dating Evgeny Markov, a man who'd presented himself as a successful businessman. In December of 2017, Markov told the woman that he wanted to surprise her and asked her to choose a romantic place. 34-year-old Kozlova opted for a scenic viewpoint overlooking the Yenisei River in the village of Ustmana, near the Siberian city of Krasnoyarsk. She drove Markov there in her Mini Cooper and, upon arrival, was asked to close her eyes for the surprise. Kozlova did as instructed, at which point Markov pulled out a knife and began stabbing her relentlessly, delivering at least 88 strikes to her head and body. The authorities found her corpse covered in lacerations inside the Mini Cooper. Shortly thereafter, 34-year-old Markov was arrested at a local restaurant as he was calmly having dinner, seemingly unshaken by the horrific crime he'd earlier carried out. Investigators later stated that he'd immediately confessed to the killing, also revealing his motive for it. Markov reported that his victim had found out that he'd lied and was actually a car washer, not a businessman. She'd purportedly laughed at Markov over his fiction, thus triggering his murderous rage. Number 2. Joshua Witt In August of 2017, a Colorado man reported that he'd been stabbed by an anti-fascist in Sheridan, blaming his haircut, which he suggested made him look like a white supremacist. The incident occurred in the context of multiple Antifa protests in the US and a growing trend of people attacking those they'd suspected of harboring extremist views. Aside from alerting local police, 26-year-old Joshua Witt also shared the story with his followers on social media. He uploaded photos of a bloody gash in his hand and blood smeared on his car. Witt claimed that his attacker had attended to stab him in the head with a pocket knife, adding that he'd managed to defend himself because of his good reflexes. He expressed outrage over the unprovoked attack, emphasizing his innocence by noting that there were no signs of him being affiliated with any extremist movement. The authorities launched an investigation into the matter, but after reviewing surveillance footage corresponding to the location and timeline of the stabbing, found no suspect fleeing from the scene, as Witt had stated in his initial police interviews. What they did find was a recording of Witt leaving a nearby sporting goods store after purchasing a small knife. Upon being questioned again, Witt admitted that he'd accidentally cut himself with a knife in his car and that he'd made up the story about the attack. He was arrested and released on a summons for false reporting. It wasn't made immediately clear if he'd lied solely for attention or to drum up negative reactions to the Antifa movement. Number 1. Vinath Odomsign Vinath Odomsign of Dublin, Georgia was charged with wire fraud in October of 2021 after it emerged that he'd lied to get an $85,000 
COVID-19 relief loan. Odom Sion had filed an application in July to the Small Business Administration's Economic Injury Disaster Loan. He falsely claimed to be the owner of an entertainment services business employing 10 people and which annually grossed $235,000 in revenue. Once the loan was approved, Odom Sion used the bulk of his payout, an estimated $57,000 to purchase a single Pokemon trading card. The items had recently become high-valued commodities among collectors, with influencer Logan Paul famously paying $150,000 for a card featuring the dragon-like character Charizard. Oldham Sign, a man in his early 30s, had purchased a card of the same character, which was a mint condition first edition released in 1999. Once he faced the legal consequences associated with his lying, the card was seized by the FBI. Odom Sign risked a maximum penalty of up to 20 years in prison and a fine of $250,000. He eventually pleaded guilty to a single count of wire fraud and in March of 2022 was sentenced to three years in prison and fined $10,000. Number 7. Sharita Dixon Cole Texas State Trooper Daniel Hubbard pulled over a female motorist on suspicion of drunk driving in the early hours of May the 20th of 2018. The woman, Sharita Dixon Cole, was ultimately arrested and charged with driving while intoxicated. In the incident's wake, she publicly accused Officer Hubbard of forcefully groping her inside and outside of his patrol car during the course of the traffic stop. The 37-year-old's claims quickly spread online. With the help of prominent social activist Sean King and attorney Lee Merritt, both of whom shared various posts about the alleged assault. In response to Dixon Cole's accusations, the Texas Department of Public Safety released a two-hour-long video of Officer Hubbard's body cam footage from the evening of the traffic stop. In the recording, Dixon Cole was shown performing a series of field sobriety tests, all of which she failed. The woman was then taken into custody and booked into the Ellis County Jail. At no point was Officer Hubbard shown to have exhibited any of the abusive behavior detailed in Dixon Cole's allegations. She subsequently issued a formal apology to the policeman and admitted that the assault had been a fabrication. The false claims were susceptible to legal action, but the Ellis County District Attorney announced that no additional charges would be filed against Dixon Cole other than the original count of driving while intoxicated. Number 6. Vanessa Blanchard On October the 29th of 2021, a school resource officer in Clarksville, Tennessee, contacted Vanessa Blanchard to inquire as to why her child hadn't been attending school in recent days. Blanchard claimed that her 12-year-old son, whom subsequent reports indicated suffered from autism, had passed away following a seizure two days earlier. Officials at New Providence Middle School subsequently raised money in an effort to help the 39-year-old mother pay for her son's funeral. Suspicions arose after school staff contacted the funeral home Blanchard claimed to be using and were told that no arrangements were being made for the boy in question. Upon being presented with this information, Blanchard claimed that she was still waiting for the autopsy results from Tenover Hospital before setting plans for the funeral into motion. Further suspicious revelations came to light, however, after the laptop issued to Blanchard's son by the school was found to be active at the Vacation Motor Hotel in Clarksville. Montgomery County Sheriff's deputies were dispatched to the hotel, where they reportedly found Blanchard's son alive and by himself in one of the rooms. The boy's mother ultimately admitted to faking his death and leaving him at the hotel for two weeks, during which she claimed to have periodically checked in on him. Blanchard was consequently arrested and charged with contributing to the delinquency of a child and false impression of death. Number 5. Rachel Matisse In the early morning hours of June the 23rd of 2016, Rachel Matisse went missing while she was on a camping trip with her family near Wells, New York. The 24-year-old's disappearance triggered a massive search effort throughout the Adirondack Mountains that came to include over a hundred state police officers, rangers, and volunteers. In the weeks that followed, state authorities received and followed up on roughly 400 leads from the public, but none of them yielded any results. Then on July the 6th, the search came to a sudden conclusion when Matisse showed up at her family's Johnstown residence. She claimed to have been kidnapped by a bearded man in his 50s or 60s who smelled strongly of cigarettes. Matisse also detailed how her alleged abductor had repeatedly assaulted her and 
held her captive in a shed before eventually dropping her off two blocks from her family's house. The police were able to use Matisse's description to create a composite sketch of the suspect that was subsequently released to the public. In a surprising twist of events, however, it was announced that a warrant had been issued for Matisse's arrest on July the 23rd. Upon detecting several inconsistencies between Matisse's story and certain pieces of electronic and medical evidence, investigators concluded that the young woman had fabricated her abduction entirely. Furthermore, eyewitnesses revealed that they'd seen Matisse at a camp belonging to a relative's boyfriend during the period in which she was supposedly missing. She was ultimately charged with falsely reporting an incident and in June of 2017, she was sentenced to four weeks in jail, three years of probation and 100 hours of community service. Number 4. Trent Freeman a former sheriff's deputy from Gilchrist County, Florida was taken into custody in December of 2021 after it was discovered that she'd lied about being hospitalized with COVID-19. According to related reports from local news outlet WCJB, 38-year-old Trent Freeman claimed to have been admitted to the hospital after contracting the virus in the fall of 2021. Over the next two months, the deputy allegedly forged multiple doctor's signatures and falsified her medical records to maintain the fraudulent claim that she'd become comatose while undergoing treatment. Freeman was actually in perfect health and had begun working full-time at what was described as a private sector non-law enforcement job. Her superiors at the county sheriff's office began to suspect her fraud in early October. Following an investigation by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, it was determined that Freeman had been lying about her medical condition, therefore swindling her colleagues out of more than $3,700 in paid sick time. After Freeman was fired from her position on October the 15th, a warrant was issued for her arrest. She ultimately turned herself in, whereupon she was charged with two counts of uttering a forged instrument and one count of scheme to defraud. Number 3. Timothy Wilkes Shortly after 9 p.m. on February the 5th of 2021, police officers in Nashville, Tennessee were dispatched to the parking lot of an urban air indoor trampoline park in response to reports of a shooting on the premises. 23-year-old David Starnes Jr. openly admitted to the officers that he'd fatally shot an individual later named as Timothy Wilkes, aged 20. Starnes denied initiating the deadly altercation and reported that it was Wilkes who'd first approached a group of people while wielding a butcher knife and claiming that he was going to rob them. Starnes, who was a part of the group being threatened, sought to defend himself and the others by pulling out a handgun and firing at Wilkes. The authorities later determined that Wilkes, a local YouTuber, and his friend had been attempting to film a video in which they captured the reactions of people being held at knife point. The prank robbery ultimately had a dramatic outcome for the young man, who failed to anticipate the possibility that one of the video's subjects might act in self-defense to his fake attack. As of the latest updates on the matter, neither Starnes nor Wilkes' friend had been charged in connection to the incident. Number 2. Ava Coleman and Christopher Kratzer At about 6 p.m. on July the 3rd of 2019, several concerned citizens contacted the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office in Georgia to report a suspected kidnapping in the parking lot of the Collection Shopping Center. According to eyewitness testimony, 17-year-old Ava Coleman was crying out for help and screaming, he's going to kill me, while sitting in a Chevrolet Tahoe with her hands bound and head covered by what appeared to be a pillowcase. Eight sheriff's deputies were rushed to the scene in a swift and ample law enforcement response that reportedly included more than half of the South Forsyth police force. The vehicle in which Coleman had been seen was subsequently located at another nearby parking lot and law enforcement initiated a traffic stop. The occupants were ordered out of the vehicle at gunpoint. Shortly thereafter, it was discovered that the alleged kidnapping had actually been a hoax devised by Coleman and 19-year-old Christopher Kratzer. The teens had reportedly planned to film the elaborate stunt in order to post it on social media. Although no one was harmed during the incident, a spokesman for the county sheriff's office contended that Coleman and Kratzer were fortunate the situation hadn't escalated further. They'd fabricated a high-tension scenario that could have resulted in them or other members of the public being hurt. The pair consequently faced felony charges of raising a false alarm and a misdemeanor count of reckless conduct. Number 1. Jessica Ann Smith 
through a Facebook post from June of 2019, Pennsylvania resident Jessica Ann Smith announced that she'd been diagnosed with colon cancer. The 31-year-old was quickly met with an overwhelmingly sympathetic response. On the 10th of the month, she created a Facebook fundraiser titled Hashtag Fight Like a Jessica, which she used to raise money for her purported extensive medical bills. Smith also allegedly started a GoFundMe campaign towards the same end, and she ultimately received more than $10,000 in donations across the two fundraising platforms. The authorities were first notified of the situation on June the 19th, when a female acquaintance of Smith's contacted the Euclid Township Police Department. She reportedly stated that to the best of her knowledge, Smith hadn't actually been diagnosed with cancer of any form. On July the 31st, Smith's husband filed an official police report in which he alleged that his wife had fraudulently obtained the Facebook and GoFundMe donations under the false pretense that she was ill. He also revealed that he knew for a fact that Smith hadn't been diagnosed with cancer as she was covered on the medical insurance he received through his employer. In November of 2019, Smith was arrested and charged with theft by deception and other theft-related counts. She was ultimately sentenced to three years of probation and mental health treatment in January of 2021. Number 8. Faith Cox Texas woman Faith Cox accused her boyfriend of assaulting her on September the 20th of 2017. She alleged that Christopher Procopia had entered her home and attacked her with a box cutter, leaving cuts on her face and chest. Fox claimed that he'd carved an X into her skin before fleeing the premises. Police took Procopia into custody on charges of first-degree felony burglary of a habitation with intent to commit additional felonies. He faced up to 99 years in prison for the alleged crimes. However, a police investigation uncovered that Procopia was entirely innocent. A selfie that he'd posted on Facebook around the same time that Cox claimed he'd assaulted her proved that he was 70 miles away from her home. An investigation into Procopia's text messages, cell phone tower pings, and witness reports confirmed his whereabouts and proved he hadn't been involved in the supposed attack. Moreover, police discovered that it was really Cox who'd inflicted the cuts on herself to frame Procopia. In light of the findings, law enforcement arrested and charged Cox with the misdemeanor of filing a false police report. She was ordered to pay a $2,000 fine and could have also been sentenced to up to 180 days in jail, but accepted a plea bargain, which reduced her sentence to a year of probation. Number 7. Nikki Yovino Teenager Nikki Yovino accused two college football players of abusing her while she was at a house party in New York on October the 15th of 2016. She alleged that the two men grabbed and took her into the basement bathroom where they forced themselves upon her. Following the accusations, the players were both suspended from their football team and had their scholarships taken away. However, according to the police, 18-year-old Yovino's story was riddled with inconsistencies and she eventually admitted that her accusations had been a lie. When interrogated, the men she'd named as her aggressors admitted to have had intimate relations with her, but maintained that it had been fully consensual. Witnesses at the party also claimed to have seen Jovino willingly enter the bathroom with them, and one attendee even audibly heard her say she wanted to sleep with both. After confessing, Jovino claimed she'd made up the story in a panic because she didn't want to ruin her relationship with another man with whom she was romantically involved. Jovino thought that her fabrication would cause her love interest to be compassionate towards her and angry at the two men instead. She was charged with second degree, falsely reported an incident and tampering with or fabricating physical evidence, resulting in a sentence of one year in jail and three years of probation. Number 6. Gemma Beale In August of 2017, a 25-year-old London woman was sent to jail for 10 years after making several false abuse allegations over the course of several years. Between 2010 and 2013, Gemma Beale claimed to have been abused by 15 different men in four different incidents. One of the men she'd accused in 2010 was Mahad Kasim, who was wrongfully sentenced to seven years in jail. 
However, in July of 2015, his conviction was reversed and he was set free after investigators uncovered a suspicious pattern of accusations by Beale, all with similar inconsistencies that indicated that she'd fabricated the stories. The woman was dubbed a serial liar, her motive being to receive compensation from each case she filed. She maintained her innocence throughout the trial that followed, but was ultimately found guilty of perjury and perverting the course of justice and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Number 5. Emery Ellis A homeless man was arrested in November of 2015 after a cashier at a Boston Burger King thought he'd tried to pay for a meal using a fake $10 bill. Emery Ellis, aged 37, was charged with forgery of a banknote, which resulted in a probation violation from a previous offense. Because of that aspect, Ellis was taken to jail, where he was held without bail. Three months later, in February of 2016, the Secret Service found that the $10 bill was in fact real. Ellis was released from jail and prosecutors dropped the forgery charge. The man went on to sue Burger King for nearly $1 million, claiming that he was discriminated against solely for looking like a homeless person of color. The outcome of the lawsuit remained undecided as of the latest updates on the matter. Number 4. Alexa Palobiki 26-year-old Sacramento police officer Alexa Palobiki was accused of filing a false police report in May of 2021. The incident in question had been a traffic stop at a gas station where Palobiki alleged that she'd approached a driver for illegally parking. The officer searched the man's car on suspicion of a DUI, something she'd initially left out of her original report, but added at a later date after confiding in her fiancé, who was also a police officer. During the stop, Palabiki found what she'd claimed was an illegal substance, which really turned out to just be tobacco. An investigation carried out by Internal Affairs revealed that Palabiki hadn't had probable cause at all to stop the man. They also uncovered that she tried to come up with six different versions of the story with another officer to make up a reason for her to search the driver's car. An audit of her arrests and reports was conducted for three years' worth of cases, combing through interviews, body cam footage and surveillance footage, as well as her phone records. Investigators highlighted at least five separate incidents of misconduct on Palabiki's part. She misrepresented or left out important facts about what happened during the incidents, in addition to reporting pursuits that never happened, failing to include suspect statements and even earning overtime payment on days when she left work early. The driver's case was eventually dropped. Once the information came to light, Palobiki was fired from her job on November the 18th of 2021 and charged with two counts of falsifying police reports. If convicted, she could face up to three years in prison. Number 3. Kirsten Faith Snyder On March the 24th of 2021, a South Carolina woman made a home invasion and assault report, which ultimately proved to be a fabrication. 22-year-old Kirsten Faith Snyder claimed that someone had cut her kitchen screen, broken into her house and assaulted her. Deputies rushed to what they believed was a burglary in progress as Snyder was on the phone with the 911 operator, actively reporting on what was happening during the alleged incident. However, when officers arrived on the scene, Snyder told them that the intruder had fled through the kitchen window after she'd allegedly fought him off. During their investigation, the authorities were able to piece together that a break-in never happened and that Snyder had not been assaulted. The woman was later charged with filing a false police report of a felony and was arrested on a $10,000 personal recognizance bond. Number 2. Caviana Zachariah Taylor On May the 22nd of 2022, a Florida woman reported a crime that led to a SWAT raid at her boyfriend's home. 20-year-old Caviana Zachariah Taylor told a 911 dispatcher that her boyfriend hit her in the face with a gun after a physical altercation had broken out between them while they were sitting in his car outside of his home. It had allegedly started when the man took Taylor's work ID badge and slapped her with it. She retaliated by punching him in the side of the head, which led to the fight inside the vehicle. Taylor then reportedly got on top of him 
with her knees in his chest, which is when he reportedly reached for his handgun. She eventually managed to kick him out of the car, got into her own vehicle and called 911 before leaving. However, when officers questioned her about the incident, the woman said that her boyfriend hadn't actually hit her with the gun. Taylor claimed that her busted lip was a result of him punching her instead which contradicted what she'd initially told the 911 dispatcher. Because of the nature of the call, the police department had sent the SWAT team, believing Taylor was in serious immediate danger. Her boyfriend was taken to the police department for questioning, and his handgun was confiscated as evidence. He told a completely different story, stating that Taylor had taken money from him and began to punch him when he tried to retrieve it. She'd also broken his car's window with a tire iron. The man even provided a text message sent by Taylor threatening to call the police and lie that he'd attacked her with a gun. With evidence backing up her boyfriend's story, Taylor was arrested and charged with simple battery, simple assault, providing false information to law enforcement, and making a false 911 call. She was held on a $10,000 bail and eventually admitted to have fabricated the story. Number 1. Lewis Mearns and Brandon Burrows In September of 2020, British woman Lorraine Cox was walking home when she was murdered by Azam Mangori, age 24, in his apartment above a kebab shop. Mangori, who was just a tenant in the apartment and had no connection to the business below him, was found guilty of Cox's murder in April of 2021. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 20 years served. However, in the early stages of the investigation, two friends of Cox's in their mid-twenties, Lewis Mearns and Brandon Burrows, were convinced that the staff of the kebab shop were somehow involved in her murder. On October the 2nd of 2020, they ganged up on Navid Rahimi, the shop's chef. In front of his home, they called him racial slurs and accused him of killing Cox before they physically assaulted him. Upon their arrest, Mearns and Burrows tried lying to the police by saying that they were elsewhere at the time of the incident. However, DNA evidence found on a drink can at the scene, the location on their phones, and eyewitness testimony from a passerby proved that they'd been responsible for the attack. Both men were found guilty of racially aggravated battery and were given sentences of 10 to 11 months in prison. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be falsely accused of not watching our videos until the end question or of stealing candy from a baby? Let us know in the comments section below.